Okay, Deb. Okay, well, uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending upon where you happen to be at this moment. Um, Chag Pesach Sameach. I am Deb Zaluda. I am from Chicago. I am on the Chicago board, and I'm also a member of MACOR, and I'm the head of the Go Northwest Task Force for JNF. And uh, welcome to the call today. Uh, we are today joined by Yaakov Katz. I know that you might have been expecting Monty Friedman, but unfortunately he was a bit under the weather today. So we thank you, Yaakov, for joining us. Um, Yaakov is an accomplished analyst who has a profound influence on Israel's government as a senior policy advisor to the Minister of Economy, Minister of Education, and Minister of Diaspora Affairs. He is a top tier educator who received a coveted fellowship at the Neiman Foundation for Jur Journalism at Harvard University, where he now teaches a much lauded course in journalism. And he is a widely read and prolific writer who served as the Jerusalem Post military reporter and defense analyst for nearly a decade and has several bestsellers, including his latest Shadow Strike, the inside story behind Israel's bombing of a Syrian nuclear reactor. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Editor-in-Chief of the Jerusalem Post, Yaakov Katz. So we're going to do this a bit of, as a question and answer. I'm going to be asking Yaakov some questions. And, uh, and then when, uh, when we're done, we'll, I guess, open it up for questions by all of you in cyberspace. So hello, Yaakov. Um, yeah. How's Chicago? Chicago is today a bit gray. Yeah, that's where I grew up. Oh, did you? Mm -hmm. West well, Rogers Park. Okay, well, Chicago. I live in Lincoln Park, and Chicago is a great, uh, a great city, and we're faring okay in this, uh, in this very strange time. We're sort of in that middle zone, middle of the country, kind of middle of COVID, et cetera. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit today about COVID nineteen and coronavirus and what we're all sort of top of mind. And maybe you can uh, give us some thoughts today as Israel's government focuses on dealing with the COVID-19 crisis. Are Israel's adversaries in the region using this as an opportunity to enhance their capabilities? Something I've actually thought about and shocked and pleasantly surprised at how quiet it's been in the region. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. And I, uh, first and foremost, want to wish everyone a Pesach Sameach, a happy Passover. Um, I hope that <clears throat> all of you, as, as this Chag, as this holiday is known in Israel, as Chag HaChirut, as the, the, the holiday of freedom, I hope that uh, we all uh, are able to enjoy our modern version of freedom, hopefully soon, when uh, we're able to break out of this lockdown that we are in definitely in Israel. I know other places around the world um, and definitely parts of the United States due to the uh, coronavirus. So hopefully we will all find some sense of liberation and redemption from, from this current uh, uh, pandemic that has afflicted all of us. Uh, and I wish you all safety and, and, and long uh, health. Um, regarding the question, it's, it's, it's a great question and it's a big unknown. Uh, you know, on the one hand, everyone, it seems quiet because everyone is very busy right now, right? Everyone is busy with dealing with the with COVID-19, with the novel coronavirus. Uh, Israel's very focused on it, but we know that the Iranians, for example, have been struck very hard by, uh, by COVID-19. The numbers that they say are probably not the true numbers, uh, but from what we've heard from intelligence analysts here in Israel, it's possible that up to half a million people in Iran have been infected with the virus which means their death toll is much higher than, it, than, than they're actually openly admitting when they talk about maybe uh, 10,000 people, but really probably much higher. At the same time, there is satellite imagery that shows in the streets of Tehran, as well as other parts of Iran, that they've been digging mass graves. So there's definitely, they're, they're distracted, they're preoccupied. Right, and when you're distracted and you're preoccupied, the let's get the Zionists kind of moves to the sidelines for a moment. On the other hand, it's important to keep in mind that they have not lost their ambition to attack Israel, to uh, try to destroy or weaken or undermine the Jewish state and, and what the state of Israel is, right? We just saw a video that the IDF released just a few days ago 
of uh, the top, one of the top Syrian military commanders visiting Hezbollah military positions along the border with Israel in the Golan Heights, right? So they're still there. Hezbollah has positions in the Golan. We saw just a week ago a mysterious, one of these additional mysterious airstrikes against a, uh, an airport near Damascus, which apparently took out uh, Iranian shipments that were making their way to Syria and possibly uh, is what usually happens, they move on to Lebanon and to help support and supply Hezbollah. So we also have Gaza and Hamas, right? And Hamas also seems to be quiet, I think since the beginning of this regional confrontation with the novel coronavirus, Gaza, we've seen maybe one or two rockets fired from the Gaza Strip. And now there's a lot of talk behind the scenes of a possibility that Israel and Hamas might do some sort of prisoner swap that would give Israel a sign of life of the two Israeli citizens who are being held in Gaza, as well as something that has to do some sort of proof or about the whereabouts of the two Israeli soldiers, uh, Oron Shaul and Hadar Golden, whose bodies have been held in Gaza since the summer of 2014, the Gaza war then. So that's something that's happening. And I saw a report last night of how uh, Hamas is saying to Israel, if you give us, <coughs> excuse me, ventilators, maybe we'll be willing to engage in some sort of negotiation with you. But the bottom line is that everyone's distracted. On the other hand, there's still stuff that's going on. I, I always like to look at it as a, you know, Israel has to mow the lawn, right? And, and sadly, there's something called the terror law that's all around us and along, around our borders, right? For now, Hamas is quiet in Gaza, so is Islamic Jihad. For now, things seem to be quiet in, in Lebanon and in, in Syria. But what we have to keep in mind is why does Israel carry out these strikes in Syria to begin with? And this is important to, to think about for a moment. If we look at Hezbollah, right? Hezbollah, I always think back to 2006 to the Second Lebanon War. When uh, I remember going up there as a, as a reporter and seeing these rockets fly across the border and strike these mountains. And, and you know, I know JNF has done a wonderful job up in the north, rebuilding and forestation and, and, and planting, uh, not just there, but obviously across the country, but definitely after the 2006 war, there were mountains that were just completely burned by these fires set off by these rockets. But at the time, Hezbollah had about 15,000 rockets that were capable of striking Haifa North. They fired about 4,300 during the Second Lebanon War, during a war of about 34 days. We're now almost 14 years later. In the span of 14 years, they've gone from 15,000 rockets to about 150,000. So they now have 10 times more. If they're able to fire 4,300 in 2006 in a future war, we expect that they're probably able to fire over 1,000 rockets in one single day, right? If back in 2006, they were only able to hit Haifa North, nowadays they could strike anywhere in the country with precision, with accuracy, with warheads that are far larger than the warheads that they had back in 2006. Now say to yourself, how did that happen? Right? We, had, we fought a war in 2006. How did they build up this amazing capability? Well, because after the war, Israel pretty much stepped away from Lebanon. There's the establishment of, the, of this international force called UNIFIL, which was supposed to have been beefed up and to prevent Hezbollah. They haven't done anything really. And therefore, Hezbollah not stopped and unchecked was able to build up this massive arsenal that threatens Israel today in a way far greater than it was threatened in the past. We don't want that to happen in Syria. We can't afford for that to happen in Syria. So the reason there's always these, always these constant airstrikes and mysterious bombings that no one takes credit for is because Israel needs to prevent the, whether it's Iranian forces or Hezbollah forces in Syria from getting a capability that will cross the threshold that will say, you know what, it's too late because if we attack now, it would spark a, a, a retaliation that we just can't sustain which is to some extent what happened today and what's, what's the status in Lebanon. A war with Lebanon would be a devastating war for Israel. I think that Israel would, would end up on top and would win and would, would, would be okay. But that type of arsenal can cause us great devastation. So we don't want to have that capability in the hands of another front in Syria. And that's why you're constantly seeing these strikes. So I think, Deb, for the time being, things are quiet because they're distracted. But let's not be living in an illusion. They have not lost their uh, desire to see us disappear from this region and from this state of Israel. Are we sensing any um, like periodic activity on Israel's part 
just to kind of let people know, like you mentioned it a little bit up on the northern border, but you know, everyone is distracted, everyone is quiet, but we don't necessarily want our enemies to feel that we are so distracted and you know, army bases are on lockdown and, and soldiers aren't really going anywhere. So I hear that and I think to myself, hmm, that's kind of weird. And I wouldn't want our neighbors to look at that as we're so distracted that we are taking our eye off the ball. Are you hearing anything? Are you seeing any motion dealing with that just to make sure that people don't just hear about how little we're doing during this time and we're all locked down? I think it's a legitimate concern, but uh, I think for that reason, for example, soldiers in the IDF today are not allowed out, right? Uh, all combat units have been called up and they're basically in for the last month without any furlough, without being out. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. And the reason is because we need to have them at a high state of alert, but without the, without the concern that they would get infected or that they would infect their base, right. they would infect their unit. Um, and you see that the scope of infections, thankfully, uh, within the IDF have remained quite limited. So that, that's because of the fact that they're keeping, especially the most essential units, the combat units, Golani, Givati, Nachal, the armored brigades, et cetera, the, the elite intelligence units, they're very focused on, on their routine missions. We might be distracted now thinking about the virus, and that's definitely what we're doing as a newspaper. I mean, 90% of our coverage right now is the virus and how the virus impacts and what the virus does. And you have, by the way, you know, you mentioned the IDF and the role that it plays. I mean, we're seeing a beautiful uh, kind of illustration, I would say, of, of really how Israel comes together and what makes Israel a unique country, right? You know, I, I was thinking about this the other day and I was saying to myself, if someone told me that in, uh, in the United States, Trump had to call up the CIA and the, uh, and, and the Green Berets to come in and help with the, you know, the, the health services to fight the virus, we would think, wow, that's, that's crazy, right? That those kind of things don't happen. But here in Israel, you have the Mossad that's helping to procure and purchase uh, ventilators as well as other life-saving equipment, the protective gear, PPEs, and other things. You have Sayyid Makal, the General Staff Reconnaissance Unit, a unit that you've all heard of because it's the unit that carried out that amazing raid in 1976 uh, to rescue the Air France hostages from Entebbe, Uganda, as well as other amazing operations over the years. Uh, they are helping the health ministry locate ventilators, carry out testing, make sure that the hospital networks are all connected and working together. You have military intelligence, which has built up a whole command and control system for the hospitals and for the health ministry. You have the defense ministry that's flying around the world, right? to bring equipment and life-saving equipment to Israel. And you have Shayet at Shloshesri, the 13th flotilla, that's our equivalent of the Navy SEALs that has taken their unique capabilities of how they breathe underwater, right? Because they, they, they dive and carry out missions that way. Cool. And they've taken these oxygen tanks and breathing techniques and they're adapting them to try to help people get uh, very condensed oxygen. Don't ask me, I'm, I'm not a medical or, or <laughs> scientist, but, uh, but this is the, the beauty of, of what Israel stands for, this characteristic of improvisation, uh, thinking out of the box, this chutzpah to, to, to push the lines and the limits of what's possible. I was talking with a relative of mine who works at Israel Aerospace Industries, and that's one of Israel's leading aerospace companies, right? They make the drones, the satellites, the long-range missiles. They've taken their whole assembly line. He's the head of R&D. They've taken their assembly line. And they've turned it into an assembly line for ventilators, as well as for other equipment. They've taken like a radar that's usually used to detect infiltrations from Israel's borders. And now it can, because it, it used thermal sensors, it can, it can detect if someone has fever or doesn't have fever. It can look at what your heart rate is and your pulse and, and the, your body temperature. This is, these are those things about Israel that we can really take pride in and say, wow, this is what makes us really unique. This ability to really improvise, adapt, and, and, and come up with new ways of doing things. And I think that that's, you know, that that's a nice, unique trait that this country really stands for. Well, I'd love, I'd love to see those headlines. That would, be, that would be a good thing. So I actually did see an interesting little thing. You talked about people from all over the world and El Al was supposed to begin flying direct from Chicago on March 22nd, obviously right. it didn't happen, but apparently an LL flight did take off today from O'Hare with all kinds of medical equipment coming to Israel. Um, and that's kind of cool. Um, so government in Israel, 
looks like hmm, maybe by the end of today, <laughs> there's going to be yet another new election because it seems like nothing is happening. Um, do you think that that's going to have any impact on um, the way Israel will continue to handle um, how it's dealing with COVID-19? Oh, I think for sure. I mean, look, you know, one of the problems that I've had throughout this whole crisis is, uh, as, as a journalist, as the editor of a newspaper, um, is I, I'm, one of my main criticisms have been that I feel that at times the government and, and our politicians and our leadership is politicizing the crisis. And, and, and this often happens, and sadly, in all countries, right? I don't think it's something that's unique to us. But uh, I see it elsewhere. But I, but I do think that what makes that problem even greater here in Israel today is the fact that we don't have a stable government. We don't have a coalition. We haven't had one now for, um, I, I guess it's already almost a year and a half, right? And, uh, and unfortunately, it, as of now, and, and it, it, things still might change, but the prime minister is supposed to be giving a statement as we speak and is supposed to be announcing what he's going to do. There was supposed to be coalition and unity talks between Prime Minister Netanyahu and the blue and white leader, Benny Gantz, uh, up until midnight with a deadline that was set by the President Rivlin, that if they don't come up with the national unity government by midnight, he would then, excuse me, pass on the mandate, so-called, to the Knesset, which would then have 21 days to see if someone can get the signature of 61 members of Knesset. And then that person, if he, if he or she gets that, those signatures, would get 14 days to form a coalition. The chance that once it moves to the Knesset that uh, one of these people get 61 signatures is very slim of that happening. So if there's no government by midnight tonight and no deal between Blue and White and Likud, I would sadly say that there's a great chance that we'll find ourselves uh, in a fourth election. And uh, it's something that sounds astounding, right? I mean, take me back to uh, December of 2018, when we went to the first election, and that election came in April of 2019, never would I have imagined that a year later, I would be talking to you after covering and running coverage of three elections, and now speaking about the uh, possibility of us being on the verge of a fourth. Um, personally, I came out in favor of the national unity government. Uh, I felt that it, it was a responsible move by Benny Gantz at a time like this, because we need a government. We need a functioning government that's able to pass the state budget. Remember, Israel doesn't have a state budget already for almost a year and a half, right? And even once the government is established, you, it'll still take months till you get a state budget. Now, you could say, so what does it make a difference? The country looks like it's okay. Well, to some extent, right? By not having a state budget, what that means is that the ministries, the welfare ministry, the milit the ID, the defense ministry, the health ministry, which now is at the at the center of everything that we're talking about, can't do long-term strategic planning because they just don't know what the budget will be tomorrow, right? So they're still working every month as a slice of one twelfth of last year's budget, but the 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 the, the challenges have changed. Right. There's developments. The needs are different today. And we're not, able to, we're not able to deal and prepare for that. So we need a state budget. You know what we also need? We need this divisiveness to come to an end. We need to bring ourselves back together as a people. The last 18 months have showed me, and I, and I say this with sadness, but the mudslinging that we've seen from the right to the left to the center against the Arabs, for the Arabs, against the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox, for the ultra-Orthodox, that can't be our story as a people. They can't be who we are. And sadly, what we've seen over the last 18 months is that that's everything that Israel's become, right? Every, every politician uh, chooses and selects the person or the population, the demographic that they negate, that they're against. Netanyahu goes out and says the Arabs are no good. Gantz will come out and say the ultra-Orthodox are no good. That can't be what we're about. Right. And I think that, that we have to bring this to an end so that we can come back together as a people and focus on what we need to do here, which is to, which is to continue to build this amazing miracle that we have, which is the state of Israel. Uh, so I think we have to wait to see. The next few hours will be critical. We'll see if they're able to reach something by midnight, which is just in about uh, three and a half hours from now. But, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical that if they don't, if they fail in the next three and a half hours and the mandate does go to the Knesset, 
the chance that we will find ourselves in a fourth election is probably increasing significantly. And then we will have a new election sometime, it looks like in July, I would guess. Right. So do, do you, uh, do, this is an issue that we're dealing with here in the United States. If, if, you, if Israel goes to another election, then you're gonna have presumably the same scenario in terms of how you deal with an election in the days of social distancing and quarantine and guidelines. You know, here they keep postponing primaries in various states and people are wondering what's gonna happen. And um, at this point, primaries are less important in terms of the presidential election because we only have one candidate on each side, one major candidate on each side. But, you know, people are even wondering what's gonna happen and, and people still want their voices heard. Do you, how do you envision that happening in Israel? It's a great question. <laughs> I don't think anyone has a good answer. You know, we had in, in the March election, there were already a number of Israelis who were in isolation, mm -hmm. right, in quarantine, and they set up a special ballot uh, poll, polling station for them. How would we do that in the age of social distancing? I don't know. I, I would hope that by July, we would somehow be out of this current uh, situation uh, to an extent, but that might be wishful thinking. I don't know. But there is no there is no process of absentee voting or yeah, voting by mail in Israel at all. Voting right? in Israel. We don't have electronic voting in Israel. We vote. The startup nation still votes in the oldest way possible, which is you walk in, <laughs> you pick a, a a white slip of paper with the letter of the uh, of the party that you're voting for. You slide it into an envelope, and then you slide that envelope into a box, and later those boxes are open, those envelopes are torn open, and they start to count the little pieces of paper. Um, that's, that's Startup Nation Israel, which is you know, exporting however many billions of dollars in cyber technology and, and most advanced weaponry in the world, but that's still how we vote. Um, I don't know, but you know, I think that our leaders need to realize is that this is a unique moment in time, right? We, we are at a juncture of where it is time for them to put the country and the people first. And I would hope is that they would recognize that that's what they need to do right now. I think, you know, uh, I'll speak about myself, right? I, when Prime Minister Netanyahu, when the decision was taken that he is indicted for charges of bribery, fraud, and breach of trust, I wrote an article, a, a, a op-ed on the uh, front page of the Jerusalem Post, where I said he needs to step down, right? Uh, this was back a year ago. Right. He needs to step down because it's just for a number of reasons, but it, it, a prime minister under with, a, with such a charge, she cannot continue to be to serve in the highest position in this country. But I recognize that even today, he is the prime minister. We need a government. We have to grapple and deal with the challenges that we face. And, 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 and as a result, it's important that we come together, right? despite the fact that I think he should remain as prime minister. But I think so. I think that everyone needs to find within themselves the, this compromise and this recognition that we are at this unique point in time that we have to find a way to come together. So, Jerusalem Post, every paper in the world, every time you go online, the first headline is this many people were diagnosed today, this curve is flattening, this many people died today, less people. Like, how do you, in your role, envision shifting that dynamic so that we can, because maybe 90% of the news is about coronavirus, but there's still that 10% and people are beginning to really be starved, I think, at least maybe it's just me, I can't imagine I'm the only one, to see more in the news than just this. Like, how do we, how, how do we shift that dynamic? Well, how do you do question. in your role? <laughs> It's a good question. What I what I can tell you is that the, um, the, the there's a hunger out there for this information, right? Uh, you know what, what we're experiencing at the Jerusalem Post, I think, is very similar to what all other news organizations are experiencing. Our online traffic, is, as an example, is up over a hundred percent from month to month and year to year. Um, we are we're, we're we're facing increased interest in every little piece of news that has to do with this virus. And I think that that's a natural uh, reaction. I think like everyone probably on this call right now, we're all hungry to find out what's happening, right? What's next? Some glimmer of hope, some piece of news that will tell us, is there a vaccine coming? What's happening? 
what's the latest development? What's the government thinking about next, whether you're in Chicago, New York, LA, or Jerusalem or Tel Aviv? Um, so I, I, uh, I understand that there's other, there are other events, there's other news that's taking place out there. But I also think that right now we, we, we play a very important role. And I think that this is a moment in time that we really see in, in I'll to, you know, not necessarily my own horn, but my organization's horn, which is journalism today is needed more than ever. Right? I, I feel that with, with every bone in my body, because when I look and I see what's happening, there's, a, there's, a, there's, an, there's an instinct within any country, and I, definitely within Israel. You know, there was a saying back during the 1982 First Lebanon War. It was in Hebrew, sheket yorim, right? Be quiet, they're shooting. What, what, what was the saying? What was the significance of it? Is that when there's a war, criticism gets pushed to the side. This isn't the time for criticism. And now th th there's, there's similar voices. Right now we're, we're facing a pandemic. How could people be critical? How could people voice dissent? But I think that this is, this is what our role is. And this is why journalism is so important today, is to ask the tough questions, is to hold our leaders accountable, right? In Israel, for example, I'll just give you one example. There was a decision early on, which I think was a good decision, don't get me wrong, but to use tools that are, uh, that are counter-terrorist tools by the Shabak, by the Shin Bet, the Israel Security Agency, to also track Israeli citizens to track their phones, their whereabouts, where they were, and, and thereby know whether they were near someone who was infected and maybe got infected themselves, or if they were infected, then to be able to warn everyone else who came into contact with them that they need to go into self-quarantine. I think it was the right move, but the way it was done with zero Knesset oversight, with zero judicial oversight, was a huge problem. We wrote against it. Other people did. It actually eventually went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court instructed the government that they need to get it approved first by the Knesset committee, which the government at first had tried to, you know, to, to go around. So I think that we, we actually came under criticism for how are we criticizing the government at a time like this, but I think that this is, this is the role. So I think that on the one hand, there is, yes, this obsession with what's happening with the coronavirus. I think that people are hungry for it. They want the information. But I also think is that what we're experiencing right now is why news organizations, why the media is so important. It's important because you all need, we all need, I need to get the, the, the information straight. I need to know the facts. I really need to know what's happening. To be able to make the decisions that I have to make as an individual, as, as a father, as a husband, right? What am I supposed to do? How do I protect my family? How do I protect my community? How do I stay protected? This is what this information is out there. And, 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 and that's why I think you need us, right? You, you, you need newspapers, you need news organizations today more than ever. So um, I would say that, I don't know who all is on this call, but I'm guessing that many people on this call would love to know, because you know, JNF, we bring people to Israel all the time. And we all want to know when and I know you can't answer this, but I don't know if you, you know, hear little tidbits out there, but you know, when, 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 do, when do you think, what are you hearing in terms of when we're going to be able to get there again? Now, I know that there, there are some planes that are landing. There was about 24 hours where BB said no planes are coming in because they didn't, people didn't do what they should have done. Um, I think that now planes are allowed to come in again. People are going to have to go to these quarantine hotels. Right. I can't imagine that that's going to last forever because there's only, you know, it, it just can't, it's not sustainable. So any, any thoughts on that? When, when, we, when we can come and help our, our friends there on the ground uh, in Israel. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm moved by the question because I don't take it for granted that people are kind of banging down the door and saying they want to come to Israel. So, you know, first of all, thank you. It, it's it's deeply moving and really you know JNF is, is is one of the great organizations. I was recently uh, I discovered this by chance, but I was put on some lists together with Russell Robinson, you know the the, the head of JNF, and uh, and we had an exchange on Facebook where he said it's an honor to be with you. I said no, it's, it's actually an honor for me to be with you and all, all that you do. So really, call a kavod to, to to all of you at JNF for what you continue to do and this 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 passion and concern for the state of Israel and the Jewish people. 
I, I wish I had an answer. I mean, Deb, you could come tomorrow, but you'd be stuck in one of these quarantine hotels for 14 days. So, I don't <laughs> well, know. I may I'm be the, doing that. You never know. <laughs> right. on, on the other hand, I, I could send you a video afterwards that someone sent me at, from the Dan Panorama uh, Hotel in Tel Aviv, which I actually was at last, pa last Passover, last Pesach with my family. But on the deck are all these young men and women who are sitting around listening to music, enjoying themselves <laughs> in the sun. So I don't know how bad it is actually at one of these hotels. But uh, more seriously, right now, the big conversation that's taking place is the exit strategy, right? Like in a war, you need to have an idea for how you're going to end this thing. And there's a lot of ideas that are going around. And we're putting a big focus on that in our coverage right now is, uh, is, is what is the exit strategy? How does it look? And there's a lot of different ideas. We ran a story today by a leading mathematician and physicist from Bar Ilan University who uh, talked about something called alt alternating weeks. So like mm -hmm. one part of the workforce will work that. week one, another one will week, work week two. And this way, if, if someone who works week one is infected, they won't infect the week two people. I mean, there's you know, all these different ways of thinking about things. There's other ideas of green zones and red zones. To be able to get to a point though, you, you can establish green zones and red zones, green where there's no infected, red zones where the infected are, you need to have increased testing. And sadly, we don't have that capability yet for, we don't have the equipment, the materials, et cetera. So we need to increase our capacity in terms of testing. So there's a lot that we need to change, but I think that right now the big focus and big, uh, big thinking is probably not gonna happen right after P Pesach, which ends this week, but can we by May 1st, which is just about you know, less than 20 days away, how can we, uh, maybe in two weeks away, how can we get to the point that we can start to let some people out? And I think there are, there are some people who need it more than others, right? I think about, for example, I have a good friend of mine, lives not far away from me here in Jerusalem. They have a child who has special needs, right? The, the children with special needs need to be back in frameworks. They need to be back in, in education systems. It, this is, it's a toll on them, it's a toll on their family. Uh, people with younger little children, uh, you know, at kindergartens and nurseries, for them to be able to go back to work, you gotta also create the framework for, for those kids. So there, there's a lot that we have to start to do. And I think that they're gonna try to think of a way that from May 1st, and maybe in a trickle at first, to, uh, to get some of us out. Uh, I'm one of the privileged few, I guess, if we could call it the privileged, who's able to go wherever he wants, right, as a, as a journalist in this country. Um, but uh, although I try to be as careful as I can and limit wherever I need to go. Uh, my wife wasn't too happy with me last week when one day I just disappeared from the house and came back and she said, where were you? And I said, oh, I just went around Jerusalem, and she said, no, really, where were you? And I'd gone to Me'asharim, which is the ultra-Orthodox neighborhood, which is the epicenter of the virus here in Jerusalem. But I explained to her later, so she wasn't too happy. But, you know, I, I, as a journalist, I feel at least, you, you got to feel the story, right? You got to be out there to get a sense of, of what's really happening. It's, it's not, there's so much, only so much you can do by Zoom, and there's only so much you can do by phone, and there's only so much you can do by, you know, by watching it on TV. You got to get out there, and you got to get a feel for it. So, I hope you'll be able to visit us soon, maybe by the summer. Uh, Bezrat Hashem, please God. But yep. uh, I got but someone I here who mentioned they're holding on to their July plane tickets. So, you know, my June now. plane tickets got canceled by LL. So now I got to figure out when I'm going to come. Right. So. <laughs> so. Right. Okay. Anybody else have questions? No? Okay. Well, once again, we really, really appreciate your time. Please, if you're going back to Maya Sharim or any place, frankly, can you wear the mask, the glove? I do, I do. <laughs> the right mask, the preventing, right. you know. The N95, it's called, or something like N95, that. N95, exactly, exactly. So uh, uh, we really appreciate your time. Thank and you very much. It was a pleasure to be with you all. Stay safe and have Stay a Chag Sameach, everyone. Chag Sameach. Bye-bye.